Testing, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your patience and thank you, Roderick. It's always hard to come into a pressured situation like that when IT gets the call. Really appreciate your help. Um, so I'll declare the meeting officially opened at 6.06pm and I'd like to start by acknowledging that we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, in relation to apologies, members on leave of absence, we have none. Um, so I'll now go straight to public question time and receiving of public statements. So welcome members of the public gallery to um, confirmation of minutes and we're dealing with the ordinary meeting of the 23rd of July 2019. Could I please have a mover and seconder for the adoption of the minutes? Move Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Fatakis. All those in favour? Declare the minutes carried. Um, we are now moving on to um, announcements by the presiding member. I have a few brief announcements to make this evening. I just wanted to just start by talking about the fact that we um, tried something new on the weekend. We moved our native plant sale away from the library where it's been for an incredibly long time to our new North Perth Common, which is our new square in the heart of North Perth. Um, it's about trying to really get some activation and a really good variety of events happening in that space and it was fantastic to see that resulted in a record attendance and record plant sales, um, probably also aided by the fact that we finally got an FTOF post machine happening at our plant sales if we've entered the 21st century. So um, that was really great. Lots of positive feedback from people who attended who hadn't actually experienced the common um, in its closed form, closed to cars and and lots of room to move. People found it really a great space and a lot of people commented they were off for breakfast or coffee and were making the most of being in the town centre. So that was a great result. Following on from that, we're about to release an EOI for free events in the North Perth Common. Um, currently we are working with North Perth Local, our local town team, and we do have 34 events scheduled already for the coming year. But with the um, EOI going out to say to people who want to host an event that's open to the community, um, we are going to waive high fees, potentially be able to support with in-kind support and in our grants. And it's really about trying to get as much activity happening in that North Perth town centre. Um, equally we've offered to Beaufort Street Network, Mary Street Piazza for free use and also to Leadable Connect, um, Leadable Village Square for free use and Leadable Connect are already making full use of that and they're holding a series of events very soon um, coming up called Eaterville. So um, that's a great result. Uh, also just to mention that we're taking our first step in consultation with our community over the introduction of the FOGO 3 bin system. Um, we will be doing a lot of consultation on the new system because we do recognise this is a significant change at the doorstop for, uh, for our residents. But this is really kick-starting the process. It's a relatively simple survey, just really trying to raise awareness that that, it's, um, that we're embarking on this engagement process to ask people their um, circumstances in terms of their dwelling, um, to ask them whether they um, have any comments or concerns so that we can identify um, where people have questions, the sorts of issues that they might have concerns about and then we can um, directly work with residents to um, have a smoother rollout as possible and to talk to the community about any issues before we roll out in October 2020. Um, our Bin, through our bin analysis, we, we typically find about 55% of our green lid bin is um, food and garden organics and we stand to not only divert a lot of waste from landfill but, but over time save money in our landfilling costs because of the landfill levy growing more and more so it meets our target of trying to achieve zero waste to landfill over, I think is it 2028, Director? Sorry, I'm keeping ten, you on your toes. Year, it's a 10-year vision. Yes, 2028, I think. Yes, that's right. Correct. Zero waste to landfill by 2028. So this is a significant step forward for us. Um, so submissions close on the 6th of September 2019. Also just wanted to mention that on Sunday, um, you know, in these roles, we do attend a lot of community events, but it was really lovely to get to the Pirate Bar in Mount Hawthorne for Transition Town Vincent's Vincent Soup event, which is a micro-granting program um, where community... Uh, people who want to um, start a new community um, uh, group or event or 
something to add to the community actually pitch to the audience. Everybody pays $10, they get some soup and they get a vote. It's a very simple idea, but it results in some really great outcomes. So last year, um, this resulted in Vincent Community Kitchen idea getting off the ground and um, Theresa, who has been running that out of the North Perth Town Hall, came back to report that over the last year, that um, initiative which brings people together to cook together um, food that's been donated that would otherwise go in the bin. Um, they have saved a 1,000 kilos of food and they see 50 to 60 people per month come together at the North Perth Town Hall to cook together and spend time together. So it's really a lovely initiative bringing people together. Um, Phil um, won the day with his idea of a tool library in Vincent and great to see that he was thinking beyond tools into things like cake tins and um, sharing of camping equipment. So that really um, caused quite a lot of excitement <laughs> in the audience. So I just wanted to raise that, that some of these events um, really do bring people together and that Transition Town Vincent has done a great idea with um, bringing sustainable ideas to life with really good community benefit. So well done to them. I will now go to the CEO for declarations of interest. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, a declaration of interest affecting impartiality from Councillor Lode in relation to item 9.5. Uh, Councillor Lode knows one of the people located within the consultation area through his son's school. Uh, the second also from Councillor Lode in relation to items 9.6 and 9.7. Councillor Loden has a personal association with one of the affected residents through his involvement in the fathering project. Declaration of impartiality from uh, Mayor Cole in relation to item 9.5. One of the submitters is known to Mayor Cole. Uh, their children um, belong to the same play group. And former. 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 Former belong to the same play group. Uh, and the final is uh, a declaration of interest from myself, a uh, financial interest in relation to item 17.1, the CEO's annual performance review. Thank you. Okay, I'll now go around the table and ask council members if they have any items that they wish to debate this evening that haven't already been raised during public question time or are already listed as absolute majority decisions being required. I'm going to start in a different order tonight. Councillor Gondoshevsky, we'll caught you on the hop. I can start over the other side. Okay, I'm going to just stick with the normal routine because that's what everyone's used to. So I'm going over to Councillor Hallett who's ready to go. 13.1. Uh, Thank you, Councillor Castle. Councillor Harley. 11.2, thanks, ma'am. Councillor Murphy. 12.4, please. Councillor Loden, Councillor Fatakis. Uh, 11.4, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. 9.4, please. Councillor Gondoshevsky, ready to go? Uh, no, nothing. nothing? Okay. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. And you've got 9.8, Emma. Add that. Add, add badge. Absolute majority. <coughs> Do you see, see the real? I just want to get out of the chair and punch that woman in the face. Watch it. <laughs> I reckon you could cure diseases if you could just bottle some of what she's got coming out of her eyes. <laughs> she's like, if you could just like, make a bit of that, we'd probably. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'm going to read out the item numbers to uh, be proposed to be moved on block by Council, which includes item 9.1, item 9.2. Item 9.3, item 10.1, item 
Item 11.1, Item 11.3, Item 12.1, Item 12.2. I'm just checking if Sharon got this. And just to clarify for people who don't know what moving items on block is all about, that means that these items will be moved as recommended by um, the officers and adopted as, as such. So there will be no debate on those items. They're accepted as recommended. Can I please have a mover for the adoption of the on block items? Councillor Castle seconded. Councillor Loden. All those in favour? I declare the on block items carried. So we now move through the agenda, firstly in the sequence in which the um, items are raised by members of the public gallery. Um, so there is not, we do move around a little bit for, um, for, just so you know, we're not going through sequentially. So the first item raised in the public gallery is item 11.5, which is pop-up play consultation results, and this is an absolute majority decision. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item? Moved Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, I'm supportive of the officer recommendation in relation to the um, pop-up play consultation results and the recommendation put forward. I note the comments from the gallery in relation to the benefits that have come through um, the pop-up play interventions to date, um, but also um, note the commentary in relation to process and consultation. Um, one of the things that our public open space strategy identified was a lack of play um, interventions and opportunities for older children and young people within our community. And these groups are notoriously hard to consult with and actually engage in those early stages. This is um, some of our interventions here are essentially attempting to um, trial play in place um, and seek community feedback um, on the ground um, from some of our hard to reach groups. Um, but I absolutely take on board the feedback that's been provided in relation to ensuring that um, by establishing a really positive um, intervention and um, play environment for young people, we're not um, actually alienating other people and park users from spaces. Um, so I think that that's something we, we um, can uh, take on board and can monitor. Um, I think that uh, we... Um, Sorry, I just wanted to go here. Um, I note that um, we're um, essentially moving some funds um, in our budget to um, facilitate um, future projects um, and also note that we've got a number of um, projects um, in the, um, that have flown from the public open space strategy um, that will be included in um, this year's budget. I'm looking forward to engaging with the community um, through the delivery of these projects um, and I uh, think that Pop-Up Play to date has overall been a really positive, um, uh, a positive new addition to the Vincent agenda um, in our open um, space um, implementation. I think we are um, op open space, the ultimately we're looking to both improve the amenity of our open space, increase access and make um, the benefits of open space available to more of our community. Um, so very supportive of this one. Thank you. Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm similarly supportive of pop-up play. Um, I um, regularly go past the pump track. My kids aren't old enough to ride bikes at this point, but uh, I go past on my way to work and dropping my daughter off at daycare and um, throughout the whole time it's been in place I've regularly seen a large number of people utilising that space. I've also gotten a lot of positive feedback particularly for that site from people in the community so it's been a great thing to see. Um, I did want to um, offer the director an opportunity to respond to some of the questions that were raised from the gallery tonight um, which summarising are uh, uh, firstly just around the consultation process for initiating pop-up play. Um, who was participating in the site workshop for the pop-up play at Britannia, um, the concerns around uh, turtles in the site, concerns around uh, elderly fall <coughs> falling at the, uh, near the site and general safety, and also there is a, a full cost of the temporary pop-up activities. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I might just take the response to the first question because the acting director wasn't director at the time of the first workshop for um, the BMX pump track. 
the idea and the um, origin of the pump track was a series over two years of submissions from uh, children living close by uh, Britannia who were um, put in community budget submissions during the annual budget process uh, for a pump track. I think it was the same submission over the course of two years um, and then uh, that submission was supported by others. So the consultation workshop was to go back directly to um, the young boy who made that submission, uh, reach out to some um, of his friends and invite him and his friends uh, with a um, cycling expert from a, a local um, cycle shop in Vincent uh, to map out and explain to those of us who may not be as BMX savvy um, exactly what they mean by burns and jumps and um, other terms which uh, I'm not so familiar with, and then to find out exactly how adventurous and what size and scale of track that they were looking for and uh, what was delivered uh, was very much consistent with um, what the children who initially made those community budget submissions were asking for, uh, but of course the track as it's been built in, um, the demonstration phase is expanded, it can be built up over time. And I can pass on to the acting director for the other questions. Yes, Sir Ian Mayor Cole, um, the, I guess the concerns that have been raised throughout the process are um, the city takes those very seriously. Um, we've worked hard to try and address each of those issues if they've been raised um, in relation to uh, the tortoises. Um, the, the parks team has investigated the ability for the tortoises to move from um, Lake Munger into the park. Um, the, the fence that exists there and the distance that they need to travel was considered to be, um, which considered to limit the number of tortoises that could move into the park. Um, given they, if the fence is damaged or it's raised because there's a gap underneath, that's something the city can look at addressing. I, I have walked and had a look at some of the fencing, but not, not all of it. A lot of it does, all, the, the stuff I've seen goes all the way to the ground. Um, where there are areas where it doesn't go to the ground, that's something we can look at. Um, the tortoises would then need to cross the dual-use path, um, and so we didn't consider that putting the pump track um, and the trail in there was going to add additional risk to the tortoises. Um, in relation to the elderly and the safety of um, users in the park, again, that's an issue that we've taken really seriously. Um, we've trialled a number of different things to try and direct the bikes um, through to uh, the pump track and the trail, um, avoiding those areas of conflict. Um, and we'll continue to monitor that, to, to work with the community, and whenever there's opportunities to, uh, whenever there are issues, we will look at further opportunities to try and limit um, the conflict and the bikes using those paths, because we understand that is an issue and want to make sure that um, we create uh, as safe an area as we can for uh, the dog walkers, uh, the users, the elderly that use those paths, and try and limit the amount of bikes using that area. Um, and in, in relation to the cost, uh, just finally, most of the works, um, well, if not all of the works, sorry, were undertaken through the operating budget with using staff time and existing contractors um, in between other works. So it's, it's very difficult to calculate um, the cost, the, the cost precisely of this project because individual staff time was, was the main contributor to the cost along with um, some of those contractors. So we don't currently have a full cost breakdown of, of the project. I guess it's something we could go away and estimate, um, staff time involved and, and contractor costs, but it's not something we've done to this date. Thank you, Director. Um, and then a separate question just around the, um, the budget allocation. So um, uh, this originally came from um, myself, I guess. I put forward a councillor budget submission three years ago, I think it was, uh, around a concern around uh, a lack of four-year-old playgrounds. Um, as time has marched on, I can appreciate that those playgrounds are... Um, um, uh, the one... Um, uh, excuse me. Um, so my concern was around my son's interaction with these playgrounds. Um, I'm, I'm coming to the conclusion that that was because of his disability. Um, so with the reallocation to uh, um, the public open space strategy, will that enable um, 
people, uh, people with mobility impairment to participate as well. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the proposal to reallocate those funds um, in no way has, the, the use of those funds in no way has been predetermined. Um, we've, we've listed the projects that are proposed um, to be carried out uh, next, or well, this financial year. Um, we do not anticipate that that will, um, you know, the whole allocation of the POS budget will be allocated on those on those projects listed under point five of the recommendation. Um, and yes, we we want to ensure that the POS um, projects that we implement are accessible in accordance with our uh, disability access inclusion plan. That they are accessible to everyone in the community as much as possible. Um, so that's a that's a really important factor. Um, that we'll be taking into consideration if this $40,000 is, is reallocated. Um, it broadens the scope of um, what those funds can be used for in relation to POS, and there's something we can work together with the community and council to consult and come up with proposals that um, will suit the broadest amount of people in the community. That's exactly the reason for this. Um, the, the POS strategy found that there was a gap when it came to um, young children sorry, children and teenagers. Um, we hadn't catered for that group as much as we'd catered for um, young children, the under fours, and so we wanted to open the scope up. So the purpose of this recommendation is to allow that money to be used more broadly for POS improvements and, and play equipment, and that can be used by the broadest amount of people as possible in the community. Thank you. Councillors, Councillor Harley. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Mayor Cole. Just a, a, a couple of questions, and I obviously um, listened carefully to the comments in the gallery as well and um, have read thoroughly the documents provided as well as all the comments, the majority of which are obviously um, you know, very positive, but there are a number of comments there that I'd just like to um, ask some further questions on. So uh, um, through you, Mayor Cole, to the Director, the issue to do with the money, um, I. Personally, I don't think that's an acceptable answer. I'd like a ballpark figure um, of what this has cost us. I don't think it's an unreasonable um, question to ask how much the pump track at Britannia has cost um, the city and the ratepayers. And I would like an understanding, is it 5,000, 10,000, 30, 50, roughly? So I, I, th I think that given this is the decision tonight and that the question's been asked from the gallery, I think we need to provide something uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I can provide a, a more um, precise response on that. The, uh, we have the parks team out in our reserves every day uh, and they're doing general maintenance. The air under the trees um, along the freeway uh, hadn't um, been maintained for a long period of time. It's starting to present a fire risk um, because of the undergrowth. So we need to, certainly we're going to have to clear a lot of the undergrowth uh, as part of our routine maintenance and fire prevention. That's just um, part of our normal salaries and operating budget. So some of that clearing then helped uh, clear a single track path, uh, which then we had two additional costs over and above staff time, which relates to uh, the limestone. There's a large stockpile of that up in our depot in the city of Stirling, which we need for routine um, parks works. And we employ an external contractor uh, to help move around that uh, limestone and that Bobcat driver is contracted uh, to work on our verges and our parks and our reserves, and I think that costs us about $75 an hour. But because of the uh, interaction of the maintenance that we do every day with the works that were related to the uh, pump track, we can't really separate those out, but which ones were, um, which was bike track specific and what work would have been just routine maintenance and uh, helping to um, clear up and um, help remove some of the debris and uh, the dead wood and uh, the dead bushes that were underneath those trees. Thank you, CEO. A technically perfect answer, but I, I just, I guess, to put on notice, we're, we're at decision point tonight, and I understand all the absorbed costs, um, but at some point we should be able to separate the stuff out. The Bobcat driver is not free. The limestone supply is still not free. I think it is reasonable for people. Um, to, who who have an interest in this 
to have a better understanding of the cost, even if you can't break it down minute by minute or item by item, but just to not be able to give a ballpark figure, five grand, 10 grand, it wasn't free. And I think that's where the question is coming from. And I think it's reasonable. So perhaps I could ask that that um, be provided um, supplementary to this council decision, that there be some attempt um, at um, estimating what this has cost because it's not cost us and it's not cost us um, zero and I guess I just want to address a couple of the other um, issues I've been down there I'm I'll just say from the outset I'm very supportive of all the pop-up um, plan initiatives I think they're fantastic um, I'm long past having um, young children but I've got a grandson now and um, he's starting to interact with some of that stuff I think it's I think it's really good and as we densify this is going to be more important, um, absolutely more important. Um, but I've been down to Britannia Park myself and I've seen, we talk about risk um, and there is risk down there and there's absolutely, there's um, necessary risk for the kids and that's what that um, is about. But there is some risk down there and I think that some of the comments that have been made tonight um, from the gallery, I think we need to take them a little bit more seriously. Um, now not, not some of those cyclists, and one of the issues was a dog being run over and a broken leg. That child may not have been associated with the pump track. So I think we need more. We would need more information about that if it was, unless it was reported at the time. It's really difficult to deal with those types of comments after the event unless um, we had a complaint from that person specifically identifying that a child was at the pump track. But I, I think for the record, what I want to do is reference back the Britannia Reserve Master Plan. Apart from people in the gallery, I'm the only person in this room who participated in this. And it was arduous. It took years. It took a lot of money. Um, and it took a lot of emotion, I can tell you, after a couple of years where the community in that immediate area lost complete faith and trust in this council administration. And I think, to be fair, may have lost some faith in some of the councillors um, at that time, none of whom are sitting around this table tonight. Because of the grand plans for Britannia, which was going to be a major soccer stadium, there was all sorts of things and a lot of politics. And we came into that Britannia Reserve Master Plan really having to build faith back with the community and listen. And we spent, I wouldn't like to estimate how many hours we spent listening to people and coming up with concepts. And we adopted that in December 2013. The master plan for Britannia really set in, tra in train the pathway, which has been absolutely a game changer down there. I know with speaking with the elderly people who are finally exercising really well, it's been a really good thing, more planting out. The area of the pump track was actually meant to be informal play. It was meant to be seating and it was meant to be nature planting. And I guess I just want to reference back to that because I support the concept of the pump track. I have a question about whether it's in the right area on that part of Britannia Reserve, um, given some of the other spare land back behind Leita Stadium, which was all also through the Britannia Reserve Master Plan intended to be free space, um, nature play, etc. That area where the pump track is at the moment was intended to be more nature based rather than pump track. Um, but I think it's good. the kids are really enjoying it. The parents are enjoying it as well. But I, I have noted and want to put on the record that I've noticed some interactions down there that I don't think are useful for the community. Um, having said that, I do want to know what it means when we say the ongoing use and improvements to the Britannia Reserve pump track. I want to know what exactly what that means. Because I have to say the the 15 minute submission we had tonight um, where one of the pump tracks in one of the other areas, which was concrete, fills me with dread. And I really hope that that is not the vision that we have for a pump track on Britannia Reserve, because I do think that that would not be keeping faith with the community. Um, and I think that that would require a significant amount of community consultation. And I'll come to an amendment at the moment on item number two, but I would like to have an understanding of what it means when we approve tonight use and improvements, what, what are the parameters of that? Expansion, concreting, just thank you, CEO. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, just to clarify, there's only one specific thing in terms of that reference to improvement is that uh, the parks team have already cleared um, 
the a track through from uh, where the pump track's located in the middle uh, of the reserve to the southern end to meet up with um, essentially where the, um, the tennis court is and, and the playground. So uh, the improvement would be just to demarcate and make clear where that track is by laying, um, to continue to lay the limestone along that track so it's visible and easy and then um, we can make it rideable or more rideable for um, smaller kids or kids who are on uh, thinner wheeled bicycles because if you have a big mountain bike you can go down there now but it's um, soft and hasn't been um, properly um, laid down as a path. The reference to other improvements is that it's now a space which uh, the children on a daily basis are making their own, making their own jumps. Uh, they take their shovels down there. Uh, the tracks theirs now so we're not going to over engineer it we're not going to be laying concrete not going to be laying asphalt um, we if the kids need some more uh, material to make bigger jumps our parks team could arrange that with basic raw materials that we already um, have in stock and we can do that in response to what the um, children ask us so thank you CEO so just to clarify through you mayor that uh, there is no there are no plans to be making that structure um, a more permanent structure. It is to remain as a more organic structure where the kids can, you know, make some of those changes. Thank you. And is there a is there a time frame um, envisaged? Is this, you know, is and what's or what's experienced from other places that have done this? Do these things last for two years, or, you know, is it likely to become a you know a permanent um, kind of feature of the park? <laughs> Uh, through you, Mirko, I'll, I'll answer that one again because I've had a few of these uh, BMX pump tracks. Uh, we, most importantly for the trial, we just, that area of Britannia is very wet. Um, and when there's heavy rains, especially on the field, uh, it holds a lot of water. Uh, so we uh, weren't intending, as part of the trial, to lay clay, which holds water. Uh, we wanted to see how um, the limestone tracks, as they were laid, uh, performed during the wet winter months. Um, we'd probably need another season to um, see uh, whether that is the right material because it could be limestone or it could be clay, but clay does tend to uh, hold the water um, when, when it's wet. So we wanted to see how it performs in terms of drainage and we didn't want to create a soggy, uh, muddy area. Uh, it's already a soggy, muddy area um, on that side and there's um, the water table is very high. So um, we're not planning to um, put any hard surfacing uh, and part of the concept was to use natural materials, uh, wood, sand, um, stone, and avoid the use of uh, metal and plastic. Um, thank you. You've answered my question, so I won't move the amendment um, to number two. That's fine. Thank you. Councillors, Councillor Patakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to, to add my support um, for the motion coming through today and just want to say I'm not surprised by the overwhelming support and it's not just within the city but um, I attend a lot, of, um, a lot of meetings and a lot of functions outside the city and it's probably one of the um, more recent um, items that we've received a lot of praise for. As a city, we um, I get a lot of positive comments about the work that we do here, but the need to actually get kids away from their screens and outside in nature is one that concerns a lot of um, a lot of parents these days. And I think don't think there goes a week by where we don't um, hear of some research and some concern about the addiction that kids have to screens and the impact of not enough nature play um, and just even independent play has on not only kids' health, um, physical health, but mental health as well. And um, I mean, Katarina actually raised one point there about drawing back to childhood and this is one of the areas in which I think back to my very independent uh, childhood in the uh, in the country, um, we had access to Dad's uh, back shed, much to Dad's uh, annoyance coming home and finding that we'd actually helped ourselves to all Dad's uh, prized tools. But we also had the benefit of a scrapyard just over the back lane to us, which we used to also help 
ourselves too. So uh, we used to um, create a lot of our own uh, our own play as well. So I look at this pop up play. I look at the inventiveness and uh, the innovation that goes with that. I've been down to each of the three sites and I've watched the kids. I've seen interaction of kids in the multi generational. Um, and I think it's fantastic. Um, I was made aware of the, the issue when uh, we went through the Imagine Vincent community consultation and it was probably one of the most consistent concerns that um, the community had was highlighting that lack of space. So again, that was highlighted in um, the public open space uh, consultation. Um, so I just want to really say, you know, wholeheartedly in support of it, um, noted the concerns that have come through in the gallery on the consultation process and I think um, it's always um, those to be noted and particularly the safety concerns um, moving forward to get more of this pop-up play happening in our community. Councillors. Um, well, I'd like to speak to this because I think there's so much that's positive here to celebrate. This has been um, a phenomenal um, project in terms of the sorts of feedback that I've received since this has been underway. Um, people who I do, do not know just contacted me to tell me how much this has had an impact on their, on their children and teenagers' lives. Teenagers who have been spending all of the school holidays down at the pump track building jumps with their friends, coming home when they're hungry, going back out again till it's dark. The old times, and this is, this is something that we just haven't really been able to offer our teenagers in Vincent. Um, the feedback has been overwhelming. This has been a process that has been open for community consultation from the 20th of May till the 12th of August and it has genuinely been a trial and I think that we should really look at um, the fact that this has been something that we've put in situ so that people can actually give it a go and try it out and that that has been a really engaging way to get feedback. Um, it's very unusual for the city to receive 145 responses to a public consultation and um, you know we received 111 comments in relation to the Britannia Reserve pop-up pump track and bike trail alone, 91% firmly in favour. And when I read some of the comments, it just really um, fills my heart with joy to, to, to read about the fact that people are talking about the fact that this is attracting children of all ages. One family commented that it's been a game changer, a magnet for children in the community aged 6 to 14 years and that they're actively, socially and safely engaged in the neighbourhood, a safe place to build cycling skills, take appropriate risk, build fitness and self-confidence, and that there are few pursuits in this demographic which encourage extended period of play beyond one hour, and that is, a, is healthful and amongst nature and supports mixed age and gender play. Um, they talk about the fact that this is challenging for teenagers and families spending wholesome time together all at the park in the one place doing different things. Um, this person talks about the fact that she's observed ne few negative impacts, still runs through the park undisturbed, my dog runs and plays on the oval and sniffs around the bush on the opposite side. And I've had lots of comments about the fact that this has really enlivened this part of Britannia Reserve, our largest open space in the city of Vincent. And in terms of consultation to predate this trial, um, I personally went to every single school in the city of Vincent during Imagine Vincent and had sessions and workshops with children and asked them what they wanted to see in Vincent and pump track was up there, skate facility was up there. Things that are creative and free and challenging, things that we have a limited we have limited in the city of Vincent. We do have fixed playgrounds. We have got the nature playground at Britannia, which was intended to extend play, and it does to a degree, but it's still fixed elements. So um, this has resonated wholeheartedly with, with younger children, older children. Parents are getting out there having a go, and people are talking about returning to Britannia Reserve for the first time in years. Um, I've been down there. I've had people who are walking dogs who don't have children approach me and say this is fantastic, that they love the vibrancy that it's brought to the park. I've had questions about the use of the pathway, that it was that we do have under 12 markings on the pathway. And I have to be very upfront and say that was only ever guidance from the City of Vincent that under the road traffic regulations, the city cannot enforce what happens on a pathway. Only the police can do that. And since the previous state government changed the laws in relation to adults riding on footpaths, there's no ability to actually even state 
that we'd actually call the police in to police an age differentiation on use of a pathway. But we have been receiving regular emails on the issues that have been raised and we have been responding. We have been putting in place more logs. We have been putting in very obvious starter points for the children to encourage them to approach the track through the car park. And we um, will continue to do that if we get additional funding which is sought, $7,500. My understanding of the expenditure is that $5,000 has been spent on capital investment, which is the limestone sand and the um, bobcat hire of the, that um, contractor, and the rest has been provided in-house. When we look at capital projects, we approve capital spends, and that's what we look at in terms of actually what staff time has been apportioned, that might be something that we can get to under our new project management framework. But at this point, it's not a common practice that we've used or that we've required previously when dealing with capital projects. Um, also, just want to say that we've had some incredibly positive feedback from KidSafe, um, who have, have contacted us about this project. They actually went down KidSafe WA to the um, bike trail and they have said that they found no safety concerns or issues identified. Uh, the design of both tracks have been well executed. The BMX track in particular has been put together using a common sense approach to avoid collisions between riders and the general public walking through the space. Signage and the making, marking of overhanging branches along with log and mulch barriers have been placed throughout the track. The City of Vincent should be congratulated for providing such a fantastic space both for BMX riders and younger children on the pump track. It is heartening to see a local government use a common sense approach to safety to encourage their residents, and I'm sure residents of other areas, to spend time outdoors in this great space. And that comment is from Tracy Blasco, Manager of Play at KidSafe WA. So, um, I have been overwhelmed by the positive feedback received. I think that it was genuinely a trial that everything that we're doing in pop-up play is low cost, is removable, does not have to be permanent. And this has been a brilliant way to actually engage people in consultation and we've seen the benefits. Often when we put out concepts or we put out plans, you'd be lucky to get six people that would respond. So this has been overwhelmingly positive. The message that I'm receiving loud and clear is that this has changed the way the children play and use uh, Britannia Reserve, that it is needed. It reflects and um, uh, supports what our public open space strategy found and I'm incredibly pleased to be able to deliver something at such low cost because I think the other thing about this is that it doesn't need to be fancy and fixed and expensive. It actually needs to be free, it needs to be creative, it needs to be raw materials and it's about inviting children and teens into our public spaces and saying to them, you are welcome and we'd like you to decide how this works and how you play in this space. And I think it's wonderful that our teenagers are engaging in this space and that we see all generations interacting at Britannia Park. So I wholeheartedly support it. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the item. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. The next item raised was item 9.6, number 48, Agena Street, Mount Hawthorne, proposed single house. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Fatakis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think this is the third time we've uh, seen this uh, at Council. Obviously, this is slightly different because it's been split in two, but um, in my mind, it's the exact same development, effectively. So, um, looking back to how I considered this last time round, um, I voted for. Um, did not, did not support the officer recommendation and supported an alternative recommendation for refusal. Um, those reasons are still the same. Um, we still have the issue around landscaping. We still have the issue around the, uh, the double garage, particularly the double garage. It's uh, the 75% 70, frontage garage. That is completely inconsistent with anything that we see on Agena Street and I can't think of anywhere in the broader Mount Hawthorne area that has something like that. Um, so, in my mind, this does not fit, um, and so I do not support the officer recommendation and would support an alternative recommendation for refusal. Councillor Fatakis. Um, 
Likewise, um, to Councillor Loden, um, there's been no changes since the uh, since the last application. Um, I supported the refusal the last time. I've not changed um, my stance or the reasoning um, since the last time. So, um, should an alternate um, be proposed, um, I'd be happy to support it. Councillors. Councillor Castle. Through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, similarly to Councillor Loder and Councillor Tarkas, I don't support the officer recommendation. I'm not convinced that this is compatible with the surrounding area. And um, as they've said, nothing's really changed since the last two times. Nothing material since um, we've dealt with this before. So I won't be supporting the officer recommendation and would welcome an alternate recommendation for refusal. Councillors, any further comments? Um, look, I just want to raise that I did raise the boundary wall issue at the previous meeting because I wanted to make sure that whatever grounds are taken to um, the SAT have um, greatest chance of success and if there was a legal avenue to ensure that that boundary wall could be built simultaneously, I felt it was necessary to explore that option. Um, I do think that... Um, I think that... the team, the administration has put a lot of thought into this application, but I think that um, the, the, the construction of the garage doors, um, the way in which that is out of keeping with the, the, the streetscape and the context, and I think that um, I really do appreciate the um, deputation that um, Damien Karahar gave today and the efforts that he's gone to identify um, the, uh, the number of uh, open carports of um, of homes without um, without car parking facilities, and the fact that just over 13% actually do have a double garage on this street does make this quite a significant contributing factor. I also would like to mention that this has triggered a review of um, what well, we were reviewing, but in terms of um, our review of the built form policy, um, we have realised that the way in which the deemed to comply provision of the R codes works does um, we. You know, it does believe sort of lead to a bit of a loophole potentially, and that the intent in Vincent is to maintain no greater than 50% of the width um, as as car as uh, garage, um, so that we uh, we will soon be advertising an amendment to our built form policy with changes to provisions, including a provision around um, the maximum widths of garage doors on any lot, whether it's subdivided or not. So it has definitely triggered um, a response in policy, given that we felt that the R codes didn't um, really deal with it in the way that we wanted under the deemed to comply provision. Um, I, I, I do note that um, an alternate would re rely on objectives. I'm confident that we can still give that a go um, and we'll speak further to that if an alternate comes forward. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the item. All those in favour? All those against? I declare the item lost. Does anyone wish to move an alternate motion? Councillor Loden moved, seconded. Councillor Fatakis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I won't labour the point. I think everybody can see the uh, um, the, it's the orange. Orange. Yes. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask a quick question. Uh, Damien did uh, raise a question during his deputation around um, if we did um, have a measure around uh, this not being compatible with the established residential zone, would some quantitative data help to support the case? Um, I was just through, uh, through uh, the chair to uh, the relevant uh, director. Through you, Mayor Cole, it's available to elected members to include the percentage of uh, dwellings within that streetscape that have double garages to quantify it. Um, you're not required to because ultimately um, there is still the provision um, within the uh, deemed provisions that establishes that purpose, but that is available to you. Sorry. Um, so, but we, ha we have that, that information, that could that information be used in the discussions going forward as well if we needed to? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, that can be used. Um, but I assume the city would need to verify the information as well. 
you, Mekol. Um, we have the administration has not had an op opportunity, I guess, to review all of the dwellings, 153 odd dwellings that has been referred to. Um, administration has reviewed Adrena Streetscape from Ashby Street to Anzac Road. Um, there were 35 dwellings in that portion, um, five of which had uh, garages. So that's approximately 14%. So that is similar to uh, Mr. Carraher's um, deputation. Um, I'm happy not to uh, add anything onto the um, the refute the uh, uh, alternative recommendation for refusal, um, but we do have that information available to us that uh, just over 13% in the whole streetscape and in that immediate area, I guess, was the 14%, and also that none of those are over. 50%, which is one of the key things, I think, for me. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Um, yeah. Councillor Fadakis. I've got nothing to add, Mayor. Councillors, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Just a brief comment. I mean, there, there's no question you can see from the officer's recommendation that the planning grounds on uh, the basis that they have fallen on the side of recommending an approval uh, for the proposed development and did so initially as well. Uh, and we, you know, we've seen some discussion in the lead up to the refusal to the group dwellings uh, and thereafter, even though SAT bizarrely refused to assess it, even though everyone was ready to, uh, to, to turn up, that's, that's their prerogative, I guess. But the, uh, the, the issue of the anomaly that exists, I concur with Mr. Carraher. I'm, it, it seems bizarre to me that a clause doesn't apply just because you fall out of the definition of the performance criteria where the, the deemed to comply is quite clear, um, but that is, uh, that is for someone else to decide. But to me, it's very simple. Some fights are worth fighting. Clearly the owner or the proponent of this development has decided they want to have a fight about this because they believe that what they've uh, designed is something worth fighting for. Uh, and I think that the message from the council uh, about the the streetscape broadly, but about this particular development is that it presents a significant uh, impost upon uh, completely in line with the objectives and for me it's absolutely a fight worth fighting because I think that if we can't prevent from uh, two garages of that nature uh, being built adjacent to each other in a, uh, in a street, in a, an area that looks as a Gina Street does, then I think that there's some serious issues with the broad planning framework and so for me this is absolutely where the objectives should stand up and uh, Provide provide a basis for where the technicalities of the planning side of it and the, and, and the numbers that are presented in the clauses in the R codes don't uh, don't protect the amenity of, of an area in that way. That the the objectives are there for exactly that purpose. So I'm happy to support the um, the motion as presented. Councillors, any comments? Okay, I'll put the alternate motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. That now brings us to item 9.7, number 48A, Agena Street, Mount Hawthorne, proposed single house. I have a mover and seconder for this item, please. Move Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Mayor. As uh, before, I don't support this uh, uh, recommendation and would support an alternative recommendation. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Just a question through you uh, to um, either the acting director or to uh, Mr. Naidu. Given that the uh, the issue about the boundary wall for the two properties, and I could have asked it earlier, was only going to be solvable through a condition requiring uh, the applicant to enter into a caveat, does that then make the issue of the boundary wall, if they are being considered separately and that's not being conditioned, does that then make them uh, worthy of mention in potential reasons for refusal because in the absence of that caveat or that condition that requires it, it's still a concern with the individual properties being considered separately. And I ask that because ultimately, given what's happened with the previous item, uh, it would be at the applicant's uh, discretion if they wish to pursue one or both matters separately if they were to take it to the tribunal. Uh, and without the mention of the boundary wall, it, it doesn't exist in planning terms if it hasn't, hasn't formed part of the refusal. Thank you, Mayor Cole. That is correct. I would agree with that. If uh, ultimately this is refused, then uh, there's a, the 
two approvals ultimately would not take effect and you couldn't tie the, the simultaneous construction together and you would need to account, um, my advice is the worst case scenario being the pursuit of either one or the other of these single houses and therefore a two-storey boundary wall. Just noting that I will seek to amend uh, an alternative motion to address that issue. I understand it hasn't been addressed on the previous application, assuming they would both be appealed to, uh, simultaneously, but at least it then appears on one of the two. Thank you. Are there any further comments on the motion before you, which is to approve the development? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? I declare it lost. Is there an alternate motion to come forward? Moved Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Top of Work. Um, I would like to, um, well actually I'll ask a question. Um, given the, the commentary from um, Councillor Toppelberg and, um, and Jay, um, can we um, do the purple one but with the appropriate additional um, wording from the, I guess it's from the, the briefing agenda uh, that we'd need to pull out for the refusal? I'm just looking quickly to see what that would be. I think potentially just taking section 1.1, 1.1, 1.2 and 1.3. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, yes, ultimately we would incorporate uh, the reasons for refusal relating to the two-storey boundary wall um, that were in the briefing report. So we can arrange that. Um, can I move the, the purple, but with an additional point five, six, and 7 referring to the points 1, 2, and 3 from the um, briefing agenda, item 5.7? around proposed lot boundary wall um, and point two being the result of the bulk of the impact and point three, the proposed development does not satisfy design principles of clause 5.4.2. We'll just give the team a little bit of time to sort that out. Do you have a question in the meantime, Councillor Tolberg? I was going no? to second the Are you amendment. Are going to second? You're seconding the amendment? Thank you. Would you, um, Councillor Topperberg, given that you know what the wording is, would you like to speak to the amendment? Okay, we'll just wait patiently then. Sure, why not? It's an opportunity. No, this. I mean, I, I will. <laughs> I will make a comment because I, I had considered it before, and this is not this is not about standing on principle. This is genuinely about trying to deliver a better outcome. I think that the uh, the process up until the initial meeting that this came to um, seemed to be quite drawn out for uh, for the applicant. I'm not sure at which point they engaged the consultant or or, uh, or otherwise, and I'm not sure what conversations were had. But I think that it's important for me that this hasn't been a mixed message from certainly from the chamber, uh, the community. Uh, have a right to have, have their say, but ultimately um, you know, we, we are not able to uh, make decisions based upon taste or otherwise. This is to do um, with the, 
the planning rules as they stand, and I think that the, the message has been clear from the Chamber, and this uh, goes to further enforce it. We're not trying to find as many reasons as possible to refuse it quite the other way. I think that we are fairly looking at the planning framework as it exists and trying to give, through a series of, me through a series of meetings and process, as much feedback as possible to explain what the issues are that we've had. And I think the fact that we've seen effectively no change to the design at all in any appearance in the chamber has made it clear that the applicant uh, either disagrees vehemently and wants to have that fight, and that's something that will happen probably outside of this chamber, or that they uh, do not understand and do not appreciate that those are real issues. And I think that these things are, uh, as I said before, that they are, they're worth standing up for in this circumstance. And I would hope that uh, whether it be a, a renewed application or a mediated outcome that we would see something that is more sensitive to uh, to the area and provides uh, there's, there is an ability on those lots even at that width to still provide to secure car bays uh, <coughs> off, off the street uh, behind a door but they would have to consider something in tandem in my personal view to be able to to reach an outcome that is uh, that would be palatable in terms of the overall design and that option has always been o open to them but that's not something the applicant has pursued and I think that the uh, the issue of the boundary wall, which is the subject of the amendment, is more so, um, it relates uh, more than anything to the inability to provide adequate landscaping on, on the southern lot in particular, which is 48A. Thank you very much for filling the void with a very um, in interesting comments. Are you ready to go? Yes, would you like to comment? Uh, so it appears on the screen now, but on the basis of this approach of incorporating uh, reasons for refusal identified in the briefing report, um, it, does that also apply for the previous item, 9.6? Is that something you want to do as well? Um, under the meeting procedures, it's not possible to do that at this point. So we have an amendment. We've had the speaker, uh, the mover, and the second to speak to it. Does anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? I don't think it's an amendment. It's because it's all one thing, isn't it? No, uh, that is an amendment. Um, would anyone else like to speak to the amendment? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Amendment is adopted. We're back to the substantive. Does anyone wish to speak to the substantive motion? Okay. Oh yes, Councillor Gonczewski. I just want to be really clear and following on from Councillor Toppelberg's comments, I, I think sometimes when we're in the chamber we might talk around things and I just want to be really direct that ultimately if this design had a single garage or a tandem garage that it would address the concerns. It would address the community concerns which have been consistently aired in this chamber and throughout this process. It would ad allow the addressing of the landscaping concerns because the unviable landscaping proposed for the um, rear of the home would be able to be spread more effectively through the front um, setback area leading to a more viable landscaping plan and that the uh, bulk of the development would be able to be more effectively screened and it would reduce the bulk of the development and the presentation to the streetscape. I think those are the things that need to be considered going forward. Um, and I just wanted to make sure I actually said them rather than perhaps talking necessarily around planning policy, etc., etc. Th th those are the things that need to be addressed. Thank you, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Are there any further comments? Okay, I'll put the alternate motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried unanimously. Okay, um, next item raised by a member of the public gallery is 9.5, which is number 11 Buxton Street, Mount Hawthorne, proposed single house. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved, Councillor Lowden. Seconded, Councillor Gonshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm not a particular fan of this development, um, and um, it's uh, quite large and substantial. Um, we've also had uh, a heritage uh, nomination, for, or sorry, a, a character retention area nomination for this area as well. But when I look at the development and, and the, the basis on what we're considering it, I can't find a plausible justification for refusal. And when I look at the neighbouring properties as well, um, it, it feels like to refuse this would be unjustified compared to what we're already seeing in that streetscape, which is really, really unfortunate. So um, I will begrudgingly support the uh, officer recommendation. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, 
I'm supportive of the officer recommendation. I've visited the site. Um, there's two things I think I want to say here. One, the only reason I'm supportive of the crossover in the front setback area is because there is an existing crossover there. Um, ultimately, I don't believe that there is um, a justification. If there wasn't an existing crossover, I don't think I'd be able to support, um, given that there is um, ready access to uh, the site from the uh, side and relay way. But there is a crossover, so I can support that. Um, and the other thing is in relation to the setback. Um, I think for me this is ultimately about um, that we have the uh, neighbouring new development that um, has changed the context of the street and has changed our calculation in terms of um, the uh, criteria around the, the five neighbouring properties. Um, but also that this development abuts a right of way and then also the side setback uh, beyond that of a, a corner lot that fronts ANZAC. Um, and from the presentation of the street, we are seeing that um, it does, it will present as a um, stepping back from the corner. Um, this is something that has been raised previously, um, and I think maybe we need to look at in terms of ongoing consideration and certainty for people that are um, building just in from the corner. I don't, I don't necessarily oppose a, a stepping back into the residential streetscape. Um, but yeah, primarily this is about looking at the overall street context, the neighbouring dwelling, the dwellings across the road. I can appreciate from the discussions in, in um, the Mount Hawthorne uh, character retention area uh, workshop recently that um, a consistent presentation to the street and uh, in relation to um, street setback and low impact development in the street frontage uh, was clearly raised with me and in the, in the room. Um, and I'm, uh, I think that going forward, um, that that will be something that we can look to tighten up in that area, um, subject to um, you know further community consultation. But um, ultimately, for this one, I'm supportive of the officer recommendation. Councillors, Councillor Fatakis, uh, just one uh, question through you, Mayor, just for clarification on the height of the uh, front, uh, the front fence, the front wall. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, yes, there is a height departure. Um, it affects the front portion of the dwelling uh, where the garage is located. Um, this is because of the natural grade of the, the land that slopes down. So on that basis, um, it does exceed, albeit um, by, I think it's 15 centimetres in terms of the boundary wall um, and the overall building height is seven centimetres over. So that is the departure. Any further comments or a comment? Councillor Vitakis? No? Councillors? Any further comments on this development? No. Um, look, I did also attend the site um, this week and um, I have found this quite a difficult one to, um, to consider given that um, there is a variation to the front setback which is relatively substantial when looking at the policy provision and there's also the issue of the double garage from the front when there is a laneway at the rear but I also understand the point about the crossover being in existence. Um, I do think that number nine Buxton Street, um, that I've raised concerns about that around the front setback and that actually when we had a workshop where we talked about maintenance of our five, five aside um, setback policy at a workshop when we started to receive complaints in Mount Hawthorne about front setbacks um, coming forward of the um, deemed to comply principle under our built form policy. Um, it is something that the community is uh, talks talks about, and it was um, quite a focus at the recent character retention serve um, for, forum, where we invited people, um, including uh, Buxton Street, who has a nomination on this um, particular area. The nomination is that just that it's not a character retention area at this point in time, um, but the policy provision in the built form policy is in place, and that is to take the five side measurement. And um, from visiting and looking at the site in relation to the setback and the way in which that inter interacts with the neighbouring properties, 
it is a, up against the right of way. Um, it has number nine Buxton Street, which in my view came too far forward on that street. Um, and that was a decision that if it had come to council would not have been something that I have supported. Um, it is there, the setback has been breached. And I think that, that when you look at the context of this dwelling next to nine Buxton Street, and the side setback of Anzac Street, it does sit within that. Also, the property across the road, I note, at four metres. So um, I did consider and contemplate putting forward an alternate um, refusal based on the front setback, um, but I think that when you consider that the applicant has gone through three iterations of plans, the DRP, Design Review Panel Chair, has been involved in the discussion and has um, provided um, that there has been responses to um, all of the issues raised. Um, it is in, sometimes when things go back and uh, responses are made, it would be good actually to close the loop with the DRP chair because it talks about the fact that further changes were made, but it doesn't appear that that then went back to the DRP chair for final confirmation. And I think that for future it would be really useful to close the gap with that DRP um, chair consultation. Um, so I appreciate that there is a much deeper setback to the second story. Um, it still um, doesn't sit 100% comfortably with me, knowing how much feedback I get about um, about uh, street setbacks. But I think that when you look at this, the home um, proposal, um, particularly I think this has been extremely illustrative, this document that... Um, Thank you to the manager for preparing that document and the site visit. It does appear to sit within the streetscape in that section um, relatively OK. Um, and I think that the open garden is a positive. Uh, it's not possible, unfortunately, to condition no fencing because that's considered minor nature development. But I think that if the applicant can keep that open and well landscaped, that does contribute to the streetscape. Um, so... Uh, while I have grappled with it, I think um, on balance um, I'm prepared to support it. Any further comments? Councillor Castle? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, look, I, I agree. I, I do have to reluctantly support this um, officer recommendation. I, I accept that we have a method of calculation for average setbacks. Um, I think this application highlights the impact that one um, property can have on the whole street. Um, in particular at 9 Buxton Street, and without that, um, the calculation and the context of the street would be quite different. So I think it's really important that we're very conscious of that, um, the impact that just that one application can have. Um, yeah, I, uh, really, I would like to have seen a, a valid reason to refuse because I don't think this is reflective of what the community wants in this area. Um, however, I can't see any... Um, defendable reasons, and so I will support it. Councillors, any further comments? I'll put it. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Toppleberg voting against. I declare it carried. So that concludes items that were raised by members of the public gallery this evening. So I'll now move sequentially through the agenda with the items that have not yet been debated. So that takes us to item 9.4, 377 Walcott Street, Corbinia, proposed for multiple dwellings amendment to approval. Can I have a move it and second? I moved Councillor Toppleberg, seconded Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor. Um Looked at this one very, very closely because I think that the proponent has been uh, somewhat um, uh, non-community minded in the way in which they've approached the DA from the outset. Uh, simple fact for me is that other than potentially from a future development at 379 or 375, uh, it would be Im impossible to actually view. Uh, it doesn't actually change the experience of any of the neighbouring properties other than just knowing that it's there. Um, and things like noise, etc., are uh, governed in other regulations. So I accept 
the concerns from the surrounding neighbours. I think that from a from an upper level uh, to on Lawler Street, there may be some interaction at some point. That's not the, the way that it exists currently. Um, but given the setbacks and the screening that's proposed, that would be uh, clearly uh, it, it wouldn't be able to be something that would be considered. So I, I think there is a potential longer term amenity impact, but um, I'm prepared to support it, uh, given that it's effectively invisible um, from the existing dwellings. Councillor Lowden. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I was initially concerned when I first looked at this, uh, but uh, when you actually look at the orientation of the design um, with that extra f floor there, um, you can't see it um, unless you're a really long, long way away, um, in which case you're not going to be able to identify it anyway. Um, it, it, it does feel a little bit like scope creep, though, that um, this was originally pr pr approved and it always makes me nervous when you sort of see changes coming back, minor changes each time. Um, but anyway. Councillors, any further comments? I'll put the amendment, or, uh, sorry, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried. That takes us to item 9.8, food stall holder fees, minor review. This is an absolute majority decision required. Moved by Councillor Gontoshevsky, seconded by Councillor Toppelberg. I'm supportive of this recommendation. Um, I need to let the seconder speak before I can move an amendment, don't I? So um, I will do that and then uh, I can come back with my right of reply at the end. Councillor Toppelberg. I shall reserve my right. Thank you. <laughs> I'll move the uh, amendment on the mustard. Yes. Is there a seconder for the amendment? Seconded Councillor Lowden. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm sharing it around. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I just briefly want to say that I, I really like this amendment. I think that um, when we look to activate some of our public spaces or look to events, I, I know we've actually sat in this room and said, you know, how can we encourage our local businesses to get out and get involved in uh, these sorts of events? And I think ultimately um, by essentially streamlining the process and reducing um, uh, Fees, it, it, it's uh, a no-brainer. It's a uh, um, we we really want our businesses in Vincent to be successful. So let's try and make that happen. Um, yeah. Councillor Lowden. I agree. Councillors, any comments on the amendment? I'm sorry, I'm going to speak to it because I'm very excited by this amendment that I put that I put on the table. Um, when we have events. Usually there are mobile food vendors and sometimes this causes upset, particularly events in town centres where there are existing food premises. premises. And this is a way of um, not only supporting our local businesses and getting them to come out and, and be mobile, but actually making, um, encouraging as many of those businesses that are um, coming in as local food vendors to be City of Vincent vent, um, vent vendors. So... Um, I, when we were talking about market stall holder um, fees, which uh, was raised by um, Kayala Market, which um, has been dealt with by the um, motion, the substantive motion, it came to my attention that we were requiring a fee of about fifty to seventy dollars from our our fixed um, premises businesses. I think they're called under the um, under the policy, and that um, there was no way of differentiating between whether that business was coming from external Vincent or was one of our own businesses. But of course, if you're a business in the city of Vincent, you already pay um, a fee for the health inspection of your own bricks and mortar business. So why would we charge a second fee? And why wouldn't we encourage our local businesses to have first preference when coming to our local events? So I think it's a really good opportunity to um, get our local businesses, encourage them to go mobile, to um, have people come and experience their offerings. It does cover cafes, restaurants, bars where they're serving food, also food retailers. 
So an opportunity um, extending for all of those different businesses that are existing in the city of Vincent. So um, really keen to help our local established businesses get out into our community, get exposure and to have preference over external businesses that um, are not in the city of Vincent. Um, particularly now that we've got our new public open spaces at North Perth Common and Leadable Village Square um, and call outs for more events happening in those spaces. I wholeheartedly support the amendment. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Thank you. I declare it carried unanimously. We're back to the substantive. Are there any further comments? I'll put the substantive. All those in favour? I declare it carried unanimously. That concludes planning and place items for the evening. You may now rest easy, unless we have a question at Info Bulletin. You just never know. <laughs> okay, so we're moving on to um, community and business services items. 11.2, um, authorisation of expenditure for the period 1st of July to 31st of July 2019. Moved, Councillor Harley, seconded, Councillor Hallett. Um, thank you, I just had one uh, question, just a query on I'm an item number and it's on page 239. It's $1,200 and it was for catering services, rewards and recognition. I just want to understand what that event was. Nunzio's Mobile Pizza. Very good pizza, by the way. But Okay, through you, Michael. That was a end of financial year event for the infrastructure directorate at the depot, where we um, uh, rewarded and celebrated a successful year with the staff based at the depot. Did any other areas of the city get an end of financial year event? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, I know that the finance team celebrates the end of financial year once they've delivered the annual budget, but uh, I, I don't think it would have involved Nunzio's mobile pizza for that team. Uh, my question is, did it involve ratepay money for the provision of catering? That's the point of my question, I guess. Just wanting an understanding of what events happened, staff events happened with... Um, I'm not yes. objecting to it, I just want to understand how much we spent. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, there was an event in the Development Services Director at the time. Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of the head what it involved or what the cost was, um, but uh, it was at uh, North Perth Bowls, uh, Bowling, Bowling Alley, um, and so the payment was for... The, the, the funds were used for... Uh, two rounds of bowling, um, and that was the extent of it. So there were no food or drinks provided as part of that, just the just the bowling, which the staff paid for their food and drinks themselves. Very admirable. Um, can I just ask through you, Mayor, um, to the CEO, whether you're able to, um, um, following this meeting, provide a breakdown, please, for end of year, end of financial year. Other councillors might not um, be interested in it, but I would like to know how much money we spent um, on those events. Thanks. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we can do that. Councillors, any further comments or questions on this item? I'll go to the seconder. Do you wish to speak to it? Uh, just another a, a question. Um, just there's a payment of 7000 for um, West End Precinct um, branding and just wondering if we could hear a little bit more about um, what that involves and how that's rolled out. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, each, it, each year each of the town teams can access um, up to $10,000 of grant funding from the city. Um, so this financial year, or sorry, previous financial year, um, the Western Arts Precinct put in an application to um, create some branding for their own precinct that they can use um, through their online platforms as well as in developing their um, action plan and the city approved that funding. So um, I believe that that expenditure is um, 
reflective of that, uh, the city's entered into a grant agreement with the West End Arts Precinct um, so that they can spend that money. Thanks, happy to support the um, report as is. I'm sorry, may I have just one more question? Yes, please? sure. Um, I just have a question in regards to an amount. This is on page 238, 3rd of July, and it's $1,625. It's supply and install anchors on um, Newcastle Street for blinds and awnings. Can I just have the address of what that, um, what the property was, please? Yes, through Mayor Cole, we'll take that on notice and provide that to you in an email. I don't, I don't have the address off the top of my head, um, but I know that was provided by the marketing team, so the events team. So I'll provide that in an email. Councillors, any further comments or questions on expenditure? Okay, I'll put the item. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Uh, we're now on to 11.4, Draft Safer Vincent Plan 2019 to 22. Can I have a mover for this item? I'm not sure who raised it. Councillor Patakis moved, seconded. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as Chair of the Safer Vincent Advisory Group, um, I want to give a big thanks to the staff for all their work on uh, this plan. Uh, thanks also to the members of the Safer Vincent Advisory Group, um, and that includes my council colleague, Councillor Gondoshevsky, um, who is an incredible um, asset to work with on uh, these advisory groups who attention to, uh, to detail. Um, I really enjoy working with her, so thank you, Susan. Um, and Noongar Outreach Services and WA Police Force uh, for their input um, and to all those who commented on the plan. Not great numbers, uh, not like a, um, a pop-up play uh, consultation, um, but nonetheless we actually had some uh, really great feedback coming through from, from the community. Um, one of the big things that highlighted in the plan was the importance of collaborating with other community um, and um, particularly government agencies um, and that recognition that there's limitations in what local government um, can do in this area and I believe that we can achieve better outcomes if we um, work together collaboratively. And we're already seeing um, some great outcomes with the um, homelessness framework um, from the members of the homelessness framework committee of which the city is a, a member um, and that really I think a big um, step forward has been um, all the various agencies and a lot of them I believe there's about 50 of the agencies finally all coming together and identifying gaps and the flow on for the city of Vincent is that really um, helps uh, helps us in an area where we're not a big council but it allows us to really focus on what we do well um, and what we can do under under limitations. Um, I also wanted to comment on the um, the action in the plan to assess the effectiveness and feasibility of a security patrol service and the number of um, the submissions actually referred to this. And this idea is often uh, suggested um, without an accurate appreciation of what it will cost uh, residents or an assessment of the true effectiveness of these services. Um, so I'm glad that we've actually highlighted that. It is um, the actual action on it um, is to assess um, the effectiveness and the viability um, of this so we can actually go to our community with a more detailed discussion um, and determine if there is a, an appetite for, for this service. Um, so in all, um, thanks for, again to the staff and um, I look forward to actually getting this uh, up and running with the Sabre Vincent Action Group. Councillor Gondoshevsky, councillors. Thank you very much, Councillor Fatakos. That was a very good overview and thank you to the work of yourself, Councillor Gondoshevsky, the Sabre Vincent Group and team for preparing this. I think um, there was some good feedback through community consultation with a variety of views. So very different perspectives out there in the community about safety and levels of intervention. So it'll be very interesting when we come to things like um, the patrols where we actually do consult over that. Um, yes, very happy to endorse this, um, this uh, strategy. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put it all those in favour. I declare it carried.
We're now moving on to Chief Executive Officer Items um, 12.3, Annual Corporate Business Plan Review and Update. This is an absolute majority decision required. Can I please have a mover and seconder for this item? Moved. Councillor Hallett, seconded. We could be here all night. Councillor Murphy put his hand up. Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Happy to support uh, the officer's recommendation to, to adopt this. Um, we've had a few, I guess, iterations, but um, I'm pleased for, for where it's ended up. Councillor Murphy. Yes, me too. Happy to support. Thank you. Councillors, any further comments on the corporate business plan? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Next item 12.4, 2019 organisational review. Moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Loden. Yes, thanks. Um, I uh, did pull this out. Sorry, you have to bear with me. I pulled it out because um, I'm actually really quite impressed with this um, organisational review. Um, when I was reading through it, um, it really did occur to me how far we've come as a council. Um, uh, I think, you know, traditionally local government has been... Um, well, you know, we're currently being criticised as a sex sector, aren't we, for being red tape? But um, we've been rigid and process-driven, hierarchical, um, uh, paralysed by strategies and plans, um, drained by serial complainers and negativity, siloed and separated, um, uh, and generally pretty poor at engagement. And I think Vincent, as a councillor over the last five, six, seven years, has really begun to turn that around. Um, and I think that this is actually taking um, that next step towards uh, a more modern and healthy organisation, um, uh, which is a clear, simple vision and values that's communicated um, and developed from within. So congratulations. I think the whole process has been really good, um, the way that you've approached this, David, engaging the staff from the outset, um, from the bottom up. It really does feel that this is something that um, the staff have real buy-in. Um, the activity, um, uh, you know, it sort of demonstrates that where possible empowers the community in decision-making and involves them. Um, I feel like taking out a, out a directorate is, um, I was a little bit unsure at first, but I'm pretty, I feel very comfortable with that now um, as uh, I think it you know, uh, de-silos the organisation, one less barrier, um, brings the team closer together. Um, I really like the um, clever, creative and courageous um, line uh, because I think that it gives the staff um, a mandate to, to create risks um, and I think that... Um, you know, without the fear of minority uh, negative voices and serial complainers. I think that's something that we're guilty of um, perhaps not doing and taking risks as much. Um, what else can I say? Uh, oh, and also uh, obviously encourage uh, to see place uh, potentially taking a bigger role um, in the future. Um, and I like the idea of uh, a mandate, roads, rubbish and place. As opposed to rose rubbish and race, um, but yeah, look, congratulations, and I thought it would be worth. I think it was worth pulling out and congratulating you and the team for for this because I think it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, and in line with what I see other progressive local governments doing across the uh, nation. So thank you. Nice work, Council Murphy, Council Loden. Um, I won't talk quite so much. Um, I, the only comment I'll make is. Um, I, this structure makes a lot of sense to me uh, with my engineering hat on. Um, it's kind of like a design, build and operate structure. I kind of, until, that, until I saw, saw, saw that, I, I, I kind of grappled with how we were organised as, as a group, but I can sort of see that that fits and the idea of bringing people and team, making create bigger teams under those groups as well is going to be really valuable. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, submitting my CMRs and, uh, and getting a response from one person. Uh, going forward as well. Yes. Councillors. Um, yes, just want to say um, that 
you know, the CEO has, has come in, was it nine months or ten months now? Ten, ten months ago and has undertaken a pretty significant body of work along with the team. Um, so um, we do appreciate that this has um, resulted in some change, um, not in, in terms of necessarily how the, the teams are holding together, but that um, a significant body of work has been undertaken. We have streamlined by one directorate and by one executive director position, which is a significant cost to the city, and um, be very interested to see the next um, proposal come forward around how we explore the concept of place within the organisation. So well done to the CEO and the team, exec team and staff for undertaking this process positively and arriving at this result. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried. That takes us to motions of which previous notice has been given. Um, we have a notice of motion 13.1 from Councillor Dan Loden, asbestos awareness. Moved by Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm experiencing charging challenges with my iPad at the moment, so um, I don't have my notes in front of me, so we'll see how this goes. Um, so this is all around asbestos, um, which is, is, can be seen as quite a scary thing. My, my first real interaction with asbestos was when... Ah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Very helpful. Um, I was, I was uh, 20 years old and we had a close family friend die of asbestosis. Um, his name was Neil Nielsen and he was 51 years old at the time. I drastically shortened his life and, and that was a horrible thing to happen and it, it put a, a great deal of fear into me about asbestos at that time as well. Um, moving forward, when I moved into my house here in uh, Mount Hawthorne, I bought the house and then looked to put an air conditioner unit into the wall for my, my son's room to moderate the temperature in the place and found out when the aircon installer came around that that whole one side of the house was asbestos. Um, not something that I knew and knew how to identify at the time, um, but what I did know, what I could see was that it was in places damaged and uh, represented a risk. Um, since that time, I've uh, become uh, much more aware of asbestos. Um, we, I've uh, received a number of uh, requests from community members about concerns around asbestos fencing that they've seen around the place. We report them through to the, the city staff. They investigate, and if that represents a risk, then they get them removed. Um, I guess uh, where this has come about is trying to increase the community's understanding of, uh, of asbestos. Um, it's unclear exactly how much asbestos there is in the city and I guess throughout the Greater Perth area, but it was obviously very common in fencing for a long time there and a lot of that fencing, to my understanding, is still in existence. Um, and if we can make our community more aware of what asbestos is, what the risks are associated with fencing and particularly how to manage it effectively, I think that'll be a really positive thing for people. This isn't our job necessarily but nobody else is taking an active role to push um, addressing the issue. Um, the second part of this is around investigating potential evidence-based programs and procedures um, to help improve safety uh, and management of asbestos as well. Um, talking to the issue of asbestos fencing, these are typically um, between the property, you commonly see them in, in rear laneways, um, these are areas where we have our staff operating. Um, we've had discussions around this in the audit committee and there's work being done in this space. But uh, there's definitely an opportunity for us to improve our practices around how we, how we manage that um, to make sure that we are keeping everybody safe in their, in, um, in their work environment as well. So I ask for everybody's support. Thank you. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Happy to um, support this. I guess two things. One, um, obviously asbestos is a, a horrific substance with um, an awful legacy and um, as a uh, series of neighbourhoods with lots of old developments, it's um, relatively prevalent. So um, I look forward to um, this potentially feeding into a broader range of strategies around um, the eventual um, eradication of it completely um, with other levels of government. Um, I'm particularly excited um, at the mention of the public health plan, um, so pull that out um, as well. Um, 
but I'm particularly excited about having this as part of the public health plan because I see that as a really great opportunity to not only identify very clearly um, the range of initiatives and um, priorities for us as a local government in health and wellbeing in our um, area, but also clearly also identifying the responsibilities of other levels of government and calling them um, out to do um, particular things where um, that might be lacking. So happy to support this. Councillors, any further comments? Um, I just would like to commend Council Loden on his interest in asbestos in our community. I agree that this is something that not, um, is not really happening at any level of government and we do have some restrictions around what we can do and that then opening up our sort of level of responsibility um, and risk to the city. But I think that um, you know, as an older as an older inner city area, we do have an awful lot of asbestos and we don't necessarily have a high under degree of understanding about not only it being in our community but about safe removal and that that needs to be very much um, clearly outlined because just ripping it out of the ground can in fact um, produce um, much more risk than leaving it in the ground if it's not done properly. So um, I do, do very much um, support this motion and um, thank Councillor Loden for his advocacy on this issue. I'll put it, all those in favour, I'll declare it carried unanimously. Um, that means that we have just one item remaining for this evening. It is a confidential item, so if I could please have a mover and seconder to go behind closed doors. Move Councillor Castle, seconded Councillor Hallett. All those in favour, declare the motion carried. Thank you. Um, Council has just resumed an um, open meeting after dealing with a confidential item this evening, which is item 17.1, Chief Executive Officer's Performance and Remuneration Review for 2018-19 and Draft COK um, Key Performance Indicators for 2019-20. Um, Council has adopted the following resolution, that Council 1 receives the Chief Executive Officer's Annual Performance Review October 2018 to June 2019, <coughs> summary report to Council included as confidential attachment 1. 2. Endorses the outcome of the review that the Chief Executive Officer has met the performance expectations of the position for the October 2018-June 2019 review period. 3. Notes the CEO Professional Development Plan for 2019-2020 in attachment 2. Approves, 4. Approves an increase of 2% to the CEO's salary component effective 18th of October 2019. And 5 approves the proposed CEO perform key, sorry, performance indicators for 2019-20 in attachment three. Thank you very much. That concludes the meeting for this evening at 8.37 p.m.